I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you tonight to the William G. McGowan Theater and the National Archives. And welcome to the eighth annual McGowan Forum on Communications, communicating the message, election results, and ramifications. Before we get on with our program, I especially want to take this opportunity to thank Sujin McGowan and the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund, Inc., represented tonight by Diana Spencer, the executive director of the fund. Thank you very much, Diana, for your support. The fund has supported this forum for the entire eight years. Tonight's panel discussion is presented in partnership with the United States Association of Former Members of Congress, and it brings to a close our year-long series of conversations on timely political topics during this election season. In the spring, a distinguished panel of former members examined the evolving state of congressional and presidential campaigns over time. And this summer, another equally distinguished panel looked at the effect of the economy and job creation on elections. Tonight, we have a panel of seasoned political hands and commentators with us to discuss Tuesday's election results. They'll examine how the changing means and methods of communication affected the outcome and they will share their thoughts on who best took, took advantage of traditional media outlets and social media to deliver their messages to voters. So many of the programs that occur in this theater and in other venues in this building are the result of our partnership with the Foundation for the National Archives. That includes this theater itself, the public vaults, the O'Brien Gallery, the Boeing Learning Center, and the Archives Shop, whose profits help fund our exhibition and education programs. Now I have the honor of introducing the chair and president of the foundation, Alelia Bundles, is president of the Madam Walker, Alelia Walker Family Archives and author of the book, On Her Own Ground, The Life and Times of Madam C.J. Walker, the award-winning New York Times best-selling biography of her great-great-grandmother. She's currently at work on the first comprehensive biography of her great-grandmother, Alelia Walker, whose Harlem Renaissance parties helped define that era. After a 30-year career as an executive and Emmy-winning producer with NBC News and ABC News, Olivia now devotes her time to writing and serving on nonprofit boards. Olivia Bundles. Thank you very much, David, the archivist of the United States. It's always fun to be right after David. We've become a really good tag team, I think. So good evening to everyone. On behalf of the board and the staff of the Foundation for the National Archives, it's my pleasure to welcome you. In this eighth year of the annual McGowan Forum on Communications, Technology, and Government, we once again are very grateful to the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund and to our board member, Sue Jen McGowan, for their very generous support. Because of them, we are sitting in this beautiful theater and because of them, we are hosting this evening's insider's view of a fascinating election season. Nothing takes the place in communicating with voters like face-to-face -face contact, of knocking on doors and shaking hands. But the way campaigns communicate now is light years away from the way they communicated even a decade ago. The changes we have seen in the last two election cycles were in full force this time around. Truly, this is a campaign year like no other, with its reliance on tweets and quants and data mining and super PAC funds, YouTube videos, ground games, Facebook, and pre-election legal challenges. When I covered Jesse Jackson's bid for president and Geraldine Ferraro's vice presidential campaign in 1984, for NBC News, we were cutting edge because one of our producers was a gadget guy who had managed to find a suitcase-sized portable phone for us. No other network had one of these phones. Only a handful of reporters had Radio Shack computers, and every night we shipped our video tapes on the plane to New York from the last campaign stop. There was none of this feeding stuff over phones and computers. Now in November 2012, we can only imagine what changes we'll see in 2016 and 2020. And now I'd like to tell you a little bit about Sue Jen McGowan. 
Sue is the founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of Flying Food Group, a production company which supplies international airlines and specialty retail retailers. If you've flown from Chicago, LA, New York, Miami, Shanghai, any number of cities, you've sampled Flying Foods menu. Sue is also the owner and founder of New Management Limited, a real estate sales leasing management and development firm with extensive holdings in the Chicago metropolitan area. In addition to being our partner at the Foundation for the National Archives, Sue serves on several other boards, including Exelon, Commonwealth Edison, Chicago's Field Museum, and Chicago Botanical Gardens. She also is president of Sue Ling Jen Charitable Fund and president of the William G. McGowan Charitable Fund. Representing Sue this evening is Diana Spencer, executive director of McGowan Charitable Fund. Please help me welcome Diana Spencer. Thank you, Alelia. I'm delighted to be here with you this evening. Um, I was going to be here this evening anyway, but am now going to share with you Sue's remarks on her behalf. She was called away on business unexpectedly and does send her regrets. So I'm not going to say I'm Sue Jen McGowan, president of the McGowan board. I don't think I could ever pull that off. We look nothing alike. So here are Sue's thoughts for you this evening. Welcome to our eighth annual McGowan Forum on Communications. Shortly after Bill's death in 1992, the fund was established in order to preserve his values and ideals. Through its grant-making programs, the fund helps address human need and protect society's most vulnerable populations. We partner with effective community providers in the areas of healthcare and medical research, education, and community initiatives. We support programs ranging from food banks to dental clinics, youth drop-in centers to homeless shelters, charter schools, and out-of-school programming. The fund has now extended over $100 million in grants in these key areas since its inception. Three years ago, we added a new legacy program to our commitment to social initiatives. That is the McGowan Fellows Program. Through it, the fund seeks to build a community of future business leaders who will pair concern for society as a whole with success in their chosen careers. Bill, who strongly believed that business success and ethics should go hand in hand, was able to complete his MBA studies at Harvard Business School because he received a scholarship to carry him through his second year. In that spirit, the fund awards full tuition scholarships to 10 second year MBA students at 10 leading US business schools. The schools partner with the fund to find outstanding candidates for the fellows program. We have welcomed our third class of fellows this year, bringing the number of talented, ethical future business leaders to 30. This exciting program is flourishing, sending ripples of excellence throughout the academic business, and governmental communities. By 2020, there will be 100 McGowan Fellows advancing an ethical agenda as they advance their careers. The William G. McGowan Theater represents another aspect of Bill's life and legacy. He loved history, he loved movies, and he loved debating the great ideas of the day. In 2003, the fund partnered with the National Archives to develop this wonderful venue where outstanding films and documentaries are screened and the public can join the national debate and examine cutting edge ideas. An annual forum on communications was also established to augment the theater. You may wonder why communications? Well, Bill McGowan was a giant in the communications industry. As head of MCI, he led his upstart communications company in a nearly decade long battle challenging AT&T's longtime monopoly on US phone service. The Justice Department joined MT MCI's suit, and in 1982, the victory over AT&T revived the US phone industry. It sparked competition and innovation and paved the way for today's advances in global communications technology. Bill was able to overcome AT&T 
because democracy protected the rule of law and open communication. Our national presidential election is a standard bearer of democracy. So it is appropriate that our topic today is communicating the message, election results and ramifications. Our distinguished, distinguished panel will discuss the national election and the campaign. They'll explore a wide array of communications channels now used by candidates to reach out to voters. We've surely come a long way from whistle stops and radio fireside chats. How many of you remember those? <laughs> Our moderator is journalist and political commentator, Stephen Roberts. Panelists include former members of Congress, Ann Northrup, Albert Wynn, Tom Davis, Bart Gordon. They are joined by David Plotz, editor of Slate. I can't wait to hear the real scoop on the campaign, the candidates, and what to expect next. Please enjoy this truly relevant and revealing analysis. Thank you very much, Diana. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dennis Hertel, a six-term Democratic member of Congress from Michigan and a past president of the United States Association of Former Members of Congress, our partners for this evening's program. During his congressional tenure, Mr. Hertel served on the Armed Services Committee for 12 years, was chair of the Subcommittee on Investigations and Oversight, and a ranking member of the Subcommittee on Research and Development. He served on the former Select Committee on Aging and its Subcommittee on Health. Mr. Hertel was elected Vice Chair of the Democratic Study Group and was a Democratic Caucus Regional Whip. He represented Congress as a NATO Assembly Delegate. He continues his work in government relations and has expanded his expertise into an even wider range of issues. Please help me welcome Dennis Hertel. Well, I'm very pleased to be here on behalf of the former members of Congress Association. We have over 650 former members of the House and the Senate. We uh, have programs that uh, reach our university and high school students, over 40 universities a year. We always send a Republican and a Democrat. And the same overseas. We also have uh, extensive election uh, monitoring uh, for our democracy building program. And so we're very, very happy to be uh, here in conjunction with the National Archives. It's been a long, arduous election. And so I'm not going to keep you from the panel. I'm very excited about hearing our panel tonight and getting on with our program. I'd like to introduce them to you now. David Platts from Slate Magazine. Bart Gordon, former member from Tennessee. Tom Davis, a very good friend from Virginia. Al, Al Wynn, uh, our former congressman from Maryland, Ann Northrup, former congresswoman from Kentucky, and Steve Roberts, our moderator, uh, who's been with the New York Times, National Public Radio, and ABC News for such a very, very long time. We really appreciate all of them being here this evening. Welcome. Delighted that you all could join us uh, uh, and uh, uh, for this uh, uh, subject that uh, is on everybody's mind, how people get information uh, about uh, elections. And as uh, several people have already told you, it's changing very rapidly. Um, I teach a course in this subject at uh, George Washington University. And I'm, this is how rapidly it changes. I have to download information from, for the course an hour before class. Um, if I try to teach this subject out of a textbook, it would be out of date the day it was published. In fact, uh, uh, it, some of it is out of date when the course begins. I've got to change it right in the, in the middle. That's how dynamic and how uh, rapid this, this change is. So I'll, I'll, I'll throw out some questions, get the, the conversation going, and then we'll leave plenty of time for those of you in the audience to join in as well. And so think of some questions. We're going to be happy to have your contributions. But I want to start um, uh, with the old media, in a sense, because uh, the candidates raised millions and millions and millions of dollars not just uh, uh, on the presidential level, but in the congressional senate level, online. They raised it uh, through um, uh, the email uh, solicitations. They raised it uh, uh, in all sorts of uh, uh, new social media platforms. And yet when they spent it, they spent it on the old media. Uh, most of it was spent on television uh, as opposed to other media. So the first question I have 
is, was that money wasted? Um, this billions of dollars spent on old media. Um, did the candidates get what they paid for? Tom, why don't you start? Well, as you know, I was chairman of the campaign committee for the House Republicans uh, for two cycles. The world has changed, and I think money was basically wasted. You look at the results, return on investment for uh, American Crossroads and some of these groups, yeah, I think they uh, blew the money. Given that amount of money, maybe they didn't know what, how much they'd have at the end when they got it. But I think most of it was just uh, put in the trash can. How about the rest of you? You agree? Wasted, Ann? Uh, you know, I had uh, three and a half billion dollar races every two years, probably one of the most expensive uh, congressional races every two years. And, uh, you know. Is that because the legislature didn't it, like you? And it, <laughs> no, it, it's just because I had a very Democrat district. There is no way you could get to a Democrat majority without me being one of the, the victims. And, in fact, I used to tease Denny Hoyer, he was on the plane so often to Louisville, I'd say, why don't you just stay at my house? You know? <laughs> <laughs> we, we become such good friends on the plane. But, you know, as, as uh, Tom knows, the NRCC and I'm sure the DCCC work very hard to put together um, the, the best ads they possibly can in behalf of the independent expenditures that they, they uh, for the campaigns they're trying to fund. But, they, they seldom hit the spot. They seldom um, I exactly meld with what the idea is that the candidate themselves are trying to put out there. And so I just say, first these of all. These are the independent expenditures. These independent, are independent, right. So I'd say, first of all, nothing will replace a candidate and their ability to articulate an issue, to present themselves, to, to lay out a position and uh, a, a plan that is that is acceptable and interesting to the public. All ads can do is to help to uh, reiterate that. They're 30 seconds, they're short, they're abbreviations of what you say, and these ads are, are sometimes good. I wouldn't say that the campaign ads that I saw this year, especially, uh, well, I'd say two-thirds of them, were particularly on spot, particularly uh, effective. And the ones then that came in as independent expenditures, I felt like often missed the mark. And so in that case, yeah, they would be, they would be um, wasted. Uh, David, uh, you follow this uh, for Slate. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm interested in, uh, in your reaction to the, uh, the view that this was the most negative campaign ever on, 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 uh, uh, in, in ads. Do you think that's true? And why was it so negative? I think that's something that everyone always says because they're, you know, they've just experienced it and they've experienced it as a as a burst of negativity. Um, I would, I would like to just sort of retreat to a, an earlier point though, as it relates to this, which is that even though there's this huge amount of money, I think I think the TV campaign is going to turn out to be the least interesting aspect of this campaign. That this campaign, what's fascinating about it, did not play, take place on TV. What's fascinating about it took place in the data mining. And in I'll the, get to that in a minute. The but outreach. I, yeah. but I, so I think that I do think that there was this huge amount of money that was spent, which was basically I agree I agree with Tom. But well, why, if, why if, if it's so wasted? Why did they spend so much money on it? Because they don't know yet. <laughs> Bart. Well, let me. I, I would agree with much of what's been said, but let me add something uh, to that. Um, and I won't get into the data mining, but th there was um, TV is more expensive than the social media. And so you may see a lot of dollars go there, but it doesn't mean that particularly the Obama campaign didn't invest a lot of time and effort uh, you know, into the social media. Um, you know, the, what you have seen in conventional wisdom is people say, well, this was a status quo election. The president got reelected, uh, kept the Democratic Senate, kept a, uh, a um, Republican House, and so money didn't really matter. Uh, there was a Wall Street Journal article today, it was entitled, Super PAC impact apply, uh, appears limited. And w there was a commentator that said, barking, uh, speaking of the super PACs, they were barking dogs that didn't bite. Well, let me just tell you that I think money does matter. If you had not been on the air, the reason it didn't matter that much, because there was a detente. There was so much money spent at each other. Well, it's actually the opposite of a detente. It was an arms race. Well, or, or you could <laughs> say an arms race, exactly. Um, uh, and so if, so each side was forced to, to think that if you didn't go on, that it didn't matter, you'd have been crushed. 
in, in, my, in my opinion. And then within, if you want to go, go to media money, there's smart money and there's dumb money. Dumb money doesn't help you that much, but there's smart money. Uh, the presidents, uh, right after the Republican primary, uh, media uh, was smart money. And, and I think most folks think that it was the foundation of making a difference you know, in this race, particularly when you had a president that was you know, running with the highest unemployment since Franklin Roosevelt. I mean, he had no business winning. So you know, I think it had to have an impact there. The, we tried to make that point. I didn't <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think he successfully made it that, that it was President Bush's fault, but anyway. Um, but again, so then you look at, okay, other smart money. John Barrow really deserves the, the uh, Artful Dodger Award, I think, for this election, and that he was in an enormously Republican uh, seat there. But he had a From plan. Georgia. Georgia. Uh, he had a, a, a plan, and that was that they had a relatively inexpensive media market. And so he just needed, a, he got outspent quite a bit. He just needed enough money to be able to lock up all he needed there. And so I think that was smart money. But the, the other, and then I'll editorialize and I'll try to be, be quick and out. Um, money had a tremendous impact because the impact it's having on future candidates and really on candidates now. I mean, to think that you, as a candidate, that you can have anonymous millions of dollars dropped on you at a moment is make you, makes you fearful. Do I really want to run? Uh, you know, I've got to maintain my financial and my, and my constituency base. And with so much redistricting now, partisan redistricting, it means you really can't think, for example, with this coming fiscal cliff. Yeah. It's going to be a really tough vote. We'll, to, we'll get into that. But let me, let to me go out. But, but, but I'm saying the reason it's a tough vote is because of the media yeah. and the money being spent. Well, Albert Wynn, uh, you've got. Um, Carl Rove and others raised $57 million from Sheldon Adelson, from one guy and his wife. Uh, they didn't win back, the Republicans didn't win back the Senate. They didn't win the uh, presidency. What are they saying to Sheldon Adelson today? Are your $57 million well spent or not? And how do they explain themselves? Well, I think Shel Sheldon Adelson is probably saying, what the hell did you do with my money? <laughs> uh, I, th I agree with the panelists that most of that money w was wasted, but in the case of you to assure destruction, you had, had to spend it. I think the most important point is the messaging underlying the money and the tactics underlying the money that, as someone said, there is smart money and dumb money. The smart money in this race was Obama's ground operation. Ground operations aren't free. People have the idea that there are a lot of people running around in tennis shoes who are volunteers. There are a lot of professionals on the ground. There are a lot of campaign offices uh, that have to be set up. Obama probably led uh, Romney by three to one in campaign offices in Colorado, for example. And so spending on media is one element of it, but just in the context of spending money, wasting money, money well spent is money that accomplishes your objective. And ground money, I think, was critical in this election. And then to go something quickly to something and said, there are very few silver bullets out there. You're spending all this money hoping that there are a couple of silver bullets in these hundreds and hundreds of ads. You can go online and find the 10 best and the 10 worst, and you'll be appalled. You'll say, my god, these ads were great. Unfortunately, some of the best ads were by people who didn't have contested races. Most people say Christy Noem, a Republican. I think South Dakota, North Dakota. South Dakota, yeah. South Dakota had one of the best ads of all, uh, featuring her grandmother. She didn't really have a hard race. I, mean, I don't think Democrats are going to do that well. Uh, so again. A lot of wasted money, uh, a lot of bad messaging, uh, but a lot of tactical decisions that may not have been the wise. Well, what was the Carl Rose's answer was it had been worse. He's quoted today as saying mm -hmm. to those folks, "If you hadn't put up the money, it would have been worse." And, and I would, and I would, add, you won one I, race. I, I, I guess, I guess it can get worse. <laughs> well, no, I, is, could, wait, can I make a point? I'm, I'm just it. telling you what that's well, what he. Yeah, no, I, I'm sure he said that was his response. Would have been the worse in terms of would have been worse for Republicans if they hadn't given the money. Yes, yeah. That's the response. I, I, and wait, and can I, can I, I'm sorry, okay. Anna, just to make a point about this. I do think if you're Sheldon Adelson, you think 57 million, really, as a percentage of his net worth, it's trivial. So he doesn't, he is not sweating that 57 Petty million. Cash. Well, actually, but he said that today. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also that even today, even now, 
politics is a cheap investment. If you're an incredibly rich person, exactly. you, can, you can still have, buy a huge amount of influence for what is a relatively small amount of money. So I don't think the fact of this defeat is going to deter very rich people from, from throwing their money into politics, because I do think you can still buy a tremendous amount with what is for them a small amount of money. Tom, what did you want to say? I was just going to say, you know, between campaign finance reform, which I'm proud to say I voted against, and Citizens United, the whole world has changed with all these independent groups. We have basically moved the power away from political parties, which has been a centering force in American democracy for 200 years, out to these groups right and left. But your question was, were the independent ads worth it? Would they get their money's worth? No. Look, putting money on the ground, you have to have some of that. I agree with you, Bart. You can't go unarmed. But a lot of these ads were superfluous. You, you turned on the playoff games, and uh, you saw more of Romney than you saw of Bryce Harper. I mean, it was just cra crazy how, how much you were seeing of this stuff. And there comes a point where you're oversaturated, and they would have been better off putting on the ground, getting some email lists. Uh, I, I will just say in the Senate campaign in Virginia, Tim Kaine had a much better uh, game uh, you know, with, the, with the new media than, than Alan did. Alan was TV. He was old style. Uh, what, they, uh, what I'd get on my BlackBerry or your iPhone was, was, was second rate. Uh, that is where things are moving and are making critical differences, and it's one reason Republicans are having a more difficult time reaching the younger electorate. We can argue we got a message and they weren't hearing it, but we're not uh, transferring it the right way. Uh, that's an important point, and uh, several of you have already mentioned that a lot of the money is moving toward social media. It's also moving toward online advertising. Right. I mean, uh, and uh, this was one of the big changes from the last election was how much of the advertising budget went into online advertising. And I have former students who work in this who said that it's, we can basically send an ad to an individual. We can target down to the individual recipient based on her uh, browsing history, based on uh, uh, what she's bought. We can figure out the ad to send. Now, how does that, if that's true, how does that change from the perspective of of, of people like yourselves who try to communicate with voters, um, how does that change the dynamic, the relationship, Anne, between you and voters? Well, I, I think there's, it becomes more sophisticated, but I, but I want to go back to the original question tied to what you said. It has to be an effective ad. And I, I can tell you, in, in all of my campaigns, I use the same media person. I think he's fabulous. I always thought he was fabulous. but. He would write a script, and we would get it and go, uh-uh, no way. And it would take, you know, eight, seven people agonizing, improving this, shaping it, talking about what the themes were, and then, yes, Larry made a fabulous ad out of it. But he, all, he won a, many awards with our ads because they, they can't just be the first draft of a, you know, you get five drafts. But what is the, diff of, what is the difference it? between doing that on TV and doing that online? What is the difference? I think because of the data mining and the other sophisticated targeting techniques, you know more about your constituent. You know more about the target that you're trying to reach, and then you can shape, and she's absolutely right about that shaping process, but then you can shape the ad much more to that individual. The ability to isolate college-educated, single white females was absolutely critical in this election. Uh, it was the target. I mean, the messages you know, are what they are, and they, they're the foundation. But if you know this person's characteristics, you can then target your message to them with much greater specificity and talk about the things that they care about or bring to their attention something that they should care about mm -hmm. maybe weren't aware of, and I think this is what happened in this whole gender uh, issue, which Obama won by about 10 points, uh, because he was talking directly to them in a very narrow and targeted now, way. Now but it, it's just an, it's an evolution of the same old uh, techniques that we've always used. Uh, I sort of, I pioneered something uh, in, in congressional races some, you know, almost 30 years ago, uh, which was we would we, got, we we had to go around at that time and uh, hand copy all of the registered voters, and then we'd find out who voted you know uh, in what primaries. Then we'd find out which of the independents. So then we would call them, and we'd say, okay, which of these you know four issues are more important to you? Uh, and then and then we would get a letter back to them on that issue. And so this is just an evolution on into again to the social media and different ways 
to but find think that. About, but think it was still, about it was still you, keying in on the issue that was important to them. But, but you now, data mining enables campaigns to sift through vast amounts of data, which includes people's online browsing histories, everything they've ever bought, um, and uh, every magazine they've ever subscribed to. Now, David, give me a sense of how you think that changes the relationship between a congressman like Bart Gordon 30 years ago and someone campaigning today. Well, um, there's a wonderful book which I commend to everybody by a guy named Sasha Eisenberg. It's called The Victory Lab, and it, it's a detailed look, uh, focusing in particular on the Obama campaign in 2008, and, and he's been writing for Slate about this in 2012, on just this point, about how they took the data and how the more sophisticated use of it um, made it, first of all, it makes your campaign much more efficient. You don't end up wasting time on people who aren't going to vote for you. And that's a, that's a tremendous, of tremendous value because there's no, you know, if someone's not going to bother to turn out or they're going to turn out and vote for the wrong person, you shouldn't have spent any time or money on them. That's number one. I, I think the, the best example I heard uh, coming out of this election actually was less high tech, which um, had to do with behavioral targeting. And the Obama people had a bunch of research psychologists who studied how people behave and looked at, in particular, what happens when people make a commitment to do something. So if people commit to do something, even if it's months earlier, they will follow up and do it. And so the Obama campaign made a concerted effort to get people to sign cards. They may have signed them back in April. They may have signed them a year ago, which said, I'm going to vote for President Obama because I support reproductive rights. They would sign these cards and come October, the Obama campaign mailed those cards back to people, <laughs> reminding them that they had done it. And it turns out that the turnout gain you get from that is enormous. People feel like, oh, I made a promise. I better follow up on it. And so that kind of insight and, and specificity um, and use of, I mean, that's a very personal thing. It's not actually technological. It's more personal. Is is a is an incredible development. Well, and, one, and one, one, can one, I just one, simplify one, that? Let me just simplify yeah, that. Yeah, sure. My grandfather used to tell me that the most important road in the county is the one in front of your house, and so the objective is to figure out, you know, what is their issue and communicate it uh, in whatever is the best way. No, I agree that the. the Smart politicians have always done the same thing. They've tried to figure out who their constituents are and what they want and meet their needs. And these but are just the, new vehicles to do but, it. But these new techniques refine yeah. this enormously. Now, one of the things that the Obama campaign did right from the beginning was that button that said, are you in? Uh, and uh, that was reflecting exactly the insight that Eisenberg is talking about. If you get people connected to the campaign, even at a very low level, you can increase uh, gradually their, their identification and their sense of ownership. But Tom, why did Obama, you mentioned that one of the key things here this year was that the Obama people, they had some leads because they did this in 2008, but why, Romney had a lot of smart people working for him. Why did uh, Obama have such an advantage in, in, in well, this? Well, it, it was a four-year operation. It was, a, it was a four-year campaign. They had lists going back four years. They continued to mine those lists throughout. They didn't just quit talking to people in 2008 and pick it up again in 2012. There was a continuing uh, conversation, continuing to get email lists and the like. Romney's caught in a Republican showdown uh, trying to get nominated and really couldn't come up for air until he had clinched the nomination. At that point, your lists are limited and it's much harder to break out of that. Um, so Obama had a huge head start. I just say one other thing, the, the Romney campaign in Virginia and elsewhere, they did very little on the registration side. Obama started early, he didn't have to worry about the nomination. So they're out going through every complex, apartment complex in Northern Virginia, ringing doors in the weekend, trying any, any, anybody who lived there, but basically the ethics, registering to vote, they worry about turning them later, but getting them registered to vote and then they turned them out on election day. Republicans ignore those places, uh, number one, but secondly, while you're battling for the nomination, they never got a good registration effort, really never got good lists. So even if they played that game and got technologically proficient, uh, they were behind the eight ball. And what about the use of social media as an ongoing communication tool? You've all been elected officials, except for me and David. Uh, but journalists use these tools too. I mean, I know Slate has been a pioneer in using social media to get your stories out. And so, how does this change, the use of Twitter, the use of Facebook, the use of these new forms of communication, how does it change the relationship between a candidate and an elected official and her constituents? Well, Steve, can I just make one other point yeah. on that? And that is, it's, 
there's a huge generational gap in terms of the voting pattern this time. Republicans are doing really well among seniors. This is the Republican Party is going to cut Medicare and do these, <laughs> but we do very well. Part of that's cultural, but part of it is the way you communicate. We're better at the old communication. We've got very little communications with the younger voters, and I think that's, that is a key component of this generational yeah. shift in voting patterns. Tom, I, you know, I have to just say, I, I'm not quite so, I think you're right at your analysis of, but why that's true, I'm not so sure it's the communication. I, I, I think it's a part that, of it. It's not total, but I, I mean, think it's a I, part. I feel a lot that, of it's cultural. And, and let me say, all that we're talking about, all the Facebook, all the Twitter, and I have a Twitter account, and I, all during the, can, the debate, I'm looking at the Twitter account. But one debate did more to move the numbers than thousands of emails and Facebook. And, and I got to tell you, by the end, I'm so overwhelmed by what's coming into my inbox, into my Facebook. I mean, I, I have all those. And I, I believe that most of the American people, I believe there are some people that are, are so addicted to Facebook, they're on it all day. I feel like the rest of the people, they get so saturated that it has, um, it, the majority of Americans, it has a diminishing effect. And, and it's really the themes of the campaign. Nothing changed this campaign more than the first debate. It had nothing to do with the Facebook. Yes, but he debate. lost. But you could make a case that well, the connection you that might he made make before the case saved that, it. I'd say there's some other things. I would say it was the uniqueness of Barack Obama. There are, Barack Obama has some constituencies that are extremely um, energized by him. For example, you know, the college students are, are one of them. They, they, and as somebody said to me, um, a Republican mother and father, they're straight A student at U of L, Barack Obama. And I said, really, why? Because he's got, because he's hot, because he's got swagger. Okay, but I, 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 let me jump let me, in on something. Yeah, I, I, because, try to talk about this. I really want to, you, you all have had the experience of communicating with constituents. You all have survived and prospered because you've been able to figure this out. I want to know whether you think it's a, this is a significant change in the way people communicate and you have a different relationship with your constituents or not. Here's the point I want to make. Yes, there's new technology, Twitter, Facebook, what have you. I don't think there's a real big difference on either side, so I don't think either side has a substantial advantage in the new technology. The factor that makes the most difference is the messaging. You know, I think Republicans are just as competent to use new media to communicate with, with single, educated women as Democrats are. The difference is the message. You start talking about reproductive rights, you start talking about insurance, you start talking about children on uh, parents' uh, in health insurance. That's messaging, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter about the media because each side can use the same technological tools the underlying message is what dictates it. And that's where it, Obama had the advantage. He had a very coherent message on a lot of different issues that people could buy into, whether it was college tuition or whether it was reproductive rights. Okay, I'm going to try to ask one more time. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me try to, I, let me you try don't trust us politicians. Let me try to no, answer. because I, we, we know all that. I want, to know, I want to know whether you think that there is a, a difference in, in, in the way public officials and candidates, because of the new communication systems, have a different relationship to their constituents or not? It, it, once again, this is an evolution. It's the same thing as how do you have that connection with, when I first got to Congress, uh, we didn't have the internet. And so we had letters, there were less people voting. But we, but we would answer all the letters and we would make that personal connection. So then the internet comes in. Then you have the Pony Express. Uh, no, yeah. 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 And they didn't so, even and have then, phones in yeah. part of your district. And so the next thing is, then, and then it's email, and you're setting up that relationship. Um, then Al Gore and others started doing open meetings. But the, you know, the, the, the idea for folks like, like um, um, Ann. I see the Albert or Ann. Absolutely. <laughs> Ann, Ann or I'm sorry. <laughs> like, Ann was in a very Democratic seat. I was in a very Republican seat. Uh, right. But, I got Republican votes because they thought they knew me. Yeah. yeah. And so then, and so this is just the next progression. The social media is the next progression going up. Now, again, you expand it, there's more and more, but also it's getting more people to vote. So, you know, again, this is just a progression of what we've always done. And, and if you want to say the politicians have taken advantage of whatever the new tools are that come along to do it. 
Steve, the, let's talk about fundraising over the internet because yeah. that has changed markedly how you raise money, small contributions. I was getting emails from candidates saying, can you click $3? We need $3 to make our goal constantly of meeting this. And it's, that's a real easy one to do. It doesn't feel like you're costing anything until you've done it about the 30th time. Um, <laughs> but my mother's generation, everything was in the mail. Our generation, we raise money uh, by uh, the uh, phones. But the younger, it's all over the internet. And that has it just it's changed it. It's how we communicate, how we raise money. Everything now for the younger generation is uh, on the internet. It's not even, they don't even watch TV except uh, through their computers now. I want to try one more time. Yeah. <laughs> just so you can take your phrase. All that's changed is the efficiency. The efficiency's changed. We're faster, we can do more, more time, but it's all efficiencies. The message is still the key. I, key I, I get that, but I, I think David and I have a different view. I mean, I, I think there's not just a quantitative difference, I think there's a qualitative difference. I think the qualitative difference is that when, by using this new technology, what's different from every other new technology is the, it's the interactivity. It's the ability to press that button and answer back in real time. And I, I'm interested, David, in your view, uh, you read Eisenberg, I have too, whether uh, the whole theory behind Obama's system was not just that this was a more efficient way of getting the same message out. That was not the theory. The theory was that you change the relationship right. with your supporters right. by giving them a greater role and a greater sense of ownership and connection to the campaign. Right. It wasn't just that you gave them new information, you changed their mindset from being passive to active, to being part of the campaign. That's what they aimed at. Now, I'm interested in what I think they were good at it. I'm interested in whether you, you think I so. I think too. that's absolutely right. And it's, it's to create a sense of intimacy. I mean, when you just think, now it may be Barack and Obama is a once in a generation candidate and no one will capture this again. But just think about the, re, the kind of sense of the psychological relationship that people have to Barack Obama who support him and compare that to the psychological relationship that people have to Mitt Romney who support him. There are people who think Mitt Romney would have been a great president. There are people who like him. There are people who are excited about him. I don't think you know that that you can the, the level of sentiment with Barack Obama is so much greater. The sense of fun and community and involvement, and they, they, I think that that campaign, as you're saying, Steve, was perfectly tuned to to push those psychological buttons of people. I mean, it's a weird way. It's like using technology to create human. To, to, not, to, to create something that has nothing to do with technology, to create human emotion, which is this sense of connection. And I think the Obama people have done it just like yeah, outrageously you, well. You know, I, 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 listen, I don't disagree, but let me just remind you, at least all, us, we realize we would get hundreds of emails every day. They'd write us about agriculture, the water, and so we would key them all. We knew what everybody would write about. Right. And we would get them back, you know, something right away on that. And then when something came up about agriculture or tobacco, whatever it was, we were getting it right back to them. So, I mean, again, this is a more sophisticated way. There's more about going it. But it is still an evolution of what we would do in the office because we had everybody. And you couldn't get an email into the office without us categorizing but was that, but what like was your issue. I, Do you think that's a say, substantive? Let me, let me it just is, but say it's about not connection. It, 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 well, but, yeah, but, but we would get back to them not only on that, but proactively on the issue they cared about. How, but people, it, how people felt about Barack Obama and how personally involved and how fun he was and how hip he was and how modern he was, almost like a John Kennedy sort of feeling about him. Do you honestly believe that, in, like John Kerry, eight, year, ten, eight years ago, could have created that? I don't think he no, could that's, have. That's a, that's I don't a, think he could right. have. No matter what Facebook he used or anything. That's, that's it's right. not going to work. It's not the and, Facebook. and Mitt it's Romney awesome. was a, a different message. kind of person. He was very private. He did not want to expose sort of his hip side or anything. I mean, probably the his most- His hip side. Probably the most, I mean, I, I said to somebody early on, he needs to use everyday examples of what happened around the dinner table when he had five sons. I have six kids. I use that all the time in my campaigns about why I thought about schools and how I thought about healthcare and, and why it meant something to me. And you know, when my daughter had cancer and the ability that we had top, it, you know, it shared with people a human side that engaged their heart. 
it, it's the candidate. I, I just don't think you can take what this candidate could do with his personality and say, well, John Kerry, if we had had the same technology, would have been I think that's person. a great point. I think it's a great point. I think we, don't, we haven't been able to test it. I do also think, at the same time that Barack Obama is a, you know, superbly good at this, that if you look at the expertise they brought, the methodology they brought, the new things they've tried, it's pretty impressive, and it does seem to have heightened I, these connections in a are, way that's These are not either-or explanations, no. because your point is a very good one. I've always believed that one of the single reasons why Barack Obama won the first time, and here's a black man getting reelected with an 8% unemployment rate. Now, how did that happen? One of the ways he did it was because he was far better at telling stories. Thank he was far know. better at doing exactly what you're talking about. Uh, and connecting with people and saying, I'm just like you and I understand your lives. See, but he used the technology to tell those stories. Yeah, I don't But it was the story that was the key. Just like it was well, the 47% yeah. no, that was no. the key. It was, you know, the, it, was the, it was the connection of the two. Can I, I not overhype this? I mean, a lot of it was just straight out demographics. Yes, exactly. And, and you can have all the messaging. You know, we could have messaged all we wanted to to some of these communities. It wasn't going to make a difference. Do we have a party branding issue in some of these areas? It's going to take a little bit more than a candidate to overcome having had to go through a nomination well, process. There's no, there's no single explanation. But, for but it did help on the turnout models. Oh, yes, it does. On the turnout models, it's absolutely critical. I mean, let me, let me and, just... And the, well, let me just finish. And the ahead. fact that, the, that President Obama was able to turn out the people that had been the most hurt in this economy and turn them out with enthusiasm is, I think, a testimony to how this stuff works. I, I just say about the demographics, too. I mean, I had an inner city district, and... It was, um, it, and it was a part of the community I absolutely loved serving. Two of my children are African American, and so my husband and I have, first of all, we had all these conversations around our kitchen table the whole time they were growing up about, about um, how the African American community becomes, takes their full place in our society. I had a great relationship with that community and do to this day, but I had, most of those precincts, it was 500 to 8. And then you knew eight people had voted wrong. You know, it's, 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 and it, it, it's, it wasn't a cruel thing. It wasn't a mad thing. It was a, a, a sort of passed down from one generation to the next sort of thing. Right. And that, it, it, when you talk about registering people to vote, Tom, I mean, you, go, you know every single person you, you register is going to vote is going to vote on your team. There's no place you could go in my district where I had a subdivision that was like that. You know, and so but this those is, demographics we, help. I, of course, but what we're talking about is the ability, this is why I keep trying to get you to focus on this. One of the- <laughs> Because you believe it's key. But because you just made the point. If you do data mining well, you can find the one person on that block. You don't need the neighborhood or the district. But, you can find the one person on your block that is for you. And Steve, the Obama team had a four-year head start on the Romney team. They had been through this four years ago. They kept their lists. They had, I mean, it's, it's and part And they didn't of the go down distract. the streets where they were going to find one person on their block. They didn't come down my street. No, they didn't, they didn't put They're the going, effort into they registration. They went door to door in the areas where they knew where 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 the you, you are you are them. you are misunderstanding how they operated because well, they did I'm very the, close to the to the, the data who's the data Ohio. mining is very different from you, you are talking about the old way of doing it you were saying you go to the democratic districts you go to the yeah. black districts you go to the hispanic districts that is not what they did and that's not how they did it and that's not how they won and tom knows that right tom you, you, but I mean, it's the same thing, a different way. Yeah, I you know. You go into the black community knowing that they're most likely going to be democratic. Okay. You do the data mining, and you get all the information, and you know uh, you don't have to see what the color of their skin is. You you know that you got the same thing because their that 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 background you've got from them tells you most likely yeah. they're well, going to be you that. Just that way. We so it's the same thing. We get just, the, you just do it a different way. We used, to, we used to get the list, the subscription list to Guns and Ammo magazine. We did yeah, our sure. fundraising. That was a, I mean, it's the same kind of thing, and they're data mining, and they're scattered all over the place yeah, when right. you get the right lists. Yeah. And the Obama campaign was way ahead of the curve on this. We were way behind. It's just, it's okay, exactly. let, me, let me ask another question. Um, one of the, we've touched on this, but I want to get each of you a chance to, to Give me your view on this. Uh, 
if the message, as Albert Wynn and others have said, is key, if the stories that you tell, as you said, Anne, are key, and I, I believe this. I think, in the end, I've covered every election since 1964, and this is my 12th presidential election, and I missed one. And I've stood outside of a lot of voting booths, and no one ever says, after they come out of the voting booth, you know, I just voted for Al Gore because of his 16-point program on climate change. That is not what they say. What they say is, I like somebody. Someone understands me. I relate to somebody. You all have been politicians. David and I have covered uh, uh, elections enough to know this. I want, I want each of you to tell me what you think the story that Barack Obama told was the most effective story this year. You're going to start with the I'll Democrats take, on I'll, that. I'll, Go I'll, ahead, I'll, Albert. I'll start. It was a story not told by Barack Obama, but told by Bill Clinton for Barack Obama. <laughs> And it was the narrative of the Democratic, that he told at the Democratic Convention when he said, look, here's what's happening, folks. They left us with a big mess. When Barack Obama comes in, he's moving in the right direction, but he's not fixing it quickly enough. So they want us to give them another shot at it, in so many words. I'm no Bill Clinton. He did it very effectively. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, that was the ball game. Because because Obama, quite frankly, had been struggling to say that. It had not come across very effectively. Bill Clinton says it at the convention, and everybody says, we get it. That's it. And that made it very easy for whatever Obama said in his acceptance speech, which people don't really talk about, uh, to be acceptable. But had that story not been played out effectively, I think it had been a different race. Who else? Go ahead. I'd say that I thought his best, and I think it was at the Democratic Convention, all sort of running together. But when he talks about his growing up as a child and the challenges that faced him and his wife and that the dream came true for them, I think is the most effective story because I think every American, no matter where they are, whether they're, you know, uh, have, have made a lot of money or have been successful in a career or is just starting out, wants to believe that that's the basis upon which our country, country is built. And him being able to connect himself personally and being able to say, this is who I was as a little boy, this is who I was as a young man, this is who, uh, who we were as we started out, and we're here to make sure that's true for everybody. I, I don't think you can beat a story like that because I think it's the essence of who we are. Interesting, Tom. I have a different perspective. I, with all due respect, I think that elected him the first time. He had a wonderful narrative. It was the American dream. Uh, but I think after four years of basically bad outcomes, they had to shift and they had to go after Romney. And I think oh. they did a splendid job of savaging him, particularly in those key states. So you think the most important story he told was about Romney, not about himself? Absol well, well, Romney, Romney helped tell that story himself. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, you know, you play it on YouTube to be very, I mean, we're just, we're being candid here. Yeah. But I think, I think savaging him in Ohio, which was a state oh, that yeah. naturally we should have done a little bit better. You just needed to do a little bit better, doing it early, defining Romney before he get off the bat. I still don't have the slightest idea what this guy is going to do in a second term and his second term vision for everything that Bill Clinton and everybody said. But we do know, I mean, my reelection campaign, in fairness, in 2006, Al, was, yeah, we're pretty bad, but they're worse. I mean, that seemed to be what the theme was. And going back, and they did a tremendous job on that and telling that story. And they did it in a lot of different ways. They did, you know, the media, inter the internet, all this stuff. And I think they did a good job doing that. That's a good that, perspective. That was the ball game. Uh, Bart, what do you oh, think? Okay, well, th there is a sweet and sour aspect of it. But, I, you know, I go back to just the, to the basics. That, as my grandfather said, the most important road in the county is the one in front of your house. It wasn't one message. It was the message to the, the family whose child had cancer uh, that health care was going to be available. It was the message to the person that was concerned about right. um, uh, gay rights. So it's micro it was, it, was, it was the message that uh, whether it was gay rights or uh, abortion, or, you know, choice, whatever it might be. So th it is the, what was that one message that was most effective for that particular person? There's not a macro 
kind of message. There may be a macro negative message, but, but again, what's the most important road in the county? And you figure that one out, and you can get to them however you want to, whether it's through social media, through the TV, or whatever. But you see, that's there what was a lot of micro campaigns going in here. Yeah. And micro targeting did a great job. Sure. Of but but I would different. agree with Tom. I mean, I think that I didn't realize that the choice was to also say the story you told about the other guy. But that was the overwhelming story. And, and I don't think, to be honest, I think it was something that Romney was not able to answer, at least not effectively, early enough. I, I would agree. I mean, I absolutely agree with Tom and would combine it with something that Ann said earlier. It's, it's also the story that Romney was unable to tell about himself, which is that I think if you had run, if the Republicans, given the state of the economy, if they had run a candidate who was reasonably decent, they should have won this election. They should have won this election. And, and well, Romney was well, unable to. Well, you can't I, name I'm another sorry, reasonably I, I decent to, candidate that was I running. I have to outside. say, I think he was more than a decent candidate. I mean, that's, I, that's I thought right. Romney was Daniels. fabulous. But I don't think, I, I, I think there were some things that happened. One of them was that he was reluctant to personally uh, tell his story or that he he didn't have that ability he was unable to yes yes, yes. but I mean I've seen you know they're they're really bad candidates I don't think Romney was a really bad candidate. we had some really ability. bad candidates yes we had some yeah, yeah <laughs> yes they're, they were out there did Rick Perry come to mind, Tom? I, mean, uh, I was uh, thinking Herman uh, Cain, but we he, was, he was definitely the best of the people who ran. Uh, uh, David, but uh, uh, 